Hello, I'm Charles Kaplan and I'm president of South Texas Commercial Association of Realtors, ST Carr. We're an overlay board for 44 counties in South Texas and we're a, a leader in commercial real estate representation. Today, we have four experts lined up to speak about the Texas economy and how you can participate in shaping the next decade of commercial real estate. First, we're going to have Tom Long. He's Chief Development Officer for the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation with a brief uh, showcase of what San Antonio has to offer. Hello. We're the lead economic development organization in the South Central Texas area dedicated to growing quality jobs in the San Antonio region. Thank you for allowing us the time on your conference agenda. Many of you may know San Antonio for the Alamo, the Riverwalk, or as a great place to come up and go shopping. But Greater San Antonio is so much more. I can give you all the pitch points, like that we're one of the fastest growing economies in the United States that our military heritage, cybersecurity dominance, and thriving tech, manufacturing, and bioscience sectors position us for future job growth. And all of this is against a backdrop of art, education, recreation, and culture creating a one-of-a-kind experience to grow a business and love life. But I have here today a video that can do a much better job of showing you what I mean. Even during this time, our San Antonio industry, education, and government leaders came together to share what it's like living, working, and thriving in San Antonio. Again, thank you for including us on your agenda today. I hope that following the conference, we may be able to welcome each of you in person, perhaps, to provide you a better introduction to San Antonio as a place for your clients to grow their business. Enjoy the virtual conference. If I can ever be of help, don't hesitate to call. Texas is such a proud, family-oriented, and business-friendly state. We love it here. We know you will too. Hidden gem, last secret, pick your cliche. It's actually true here. We're better than any other city in standing up for business. You might think it's a temporary relocation, and end up staying a while. Of course, we love it when people move here, but we like to grow our own too. Everyone deserves an opportunity for an excellent education. That's why we work with industry partners to make sure our graduates are ready for work. We're part of a $1 billion R&D ecosystem, including cyber, data science, advanced manufacturing, and precision therapeutics for chronic diseases. Every year, we turn out more than 650 certified cyber experts from the top program in the country, alongside 30,000 other degreed professionals from all of our higher education institutions here in Greater San Antonio. Commercialization of military assets is key. San Antonio is the only place in America with DOD assets across medical, cyber, and tech fields. It's 300 years of military culture that makes it possible. We live the good life for less. I'm in the premier high rise downtown by day and in the Texas Hill Country at night. We don't sacrifice. Class A space is prime for the taking here. San Antonio is an unpainted campus. Make it your masterpiece. We have our visionaries like everyone else, but for the most part, we are an untapped market with huge potential. Water? No, the future is not the issue. With the nation's largest desalination plant and the most diversified water portfolio, we have what a lot of metros wish they had. We have municipally owned water and power companies that think globally and act locally. In fact, we are currently designing a new energy storage RFP that is going to help change the global landscape for new energy solutions, including energy storage. We surveyed thousands of business people, and the number one thing that people say about San Antonio is how welcoming and compelling our diverse, inclusive culture is. There are many incredible purpose-driven companies here who operate great businesses while doing so much to help our communities thrive. San Antonio is the perfect place 
for tech, manufacturing, and headquarter operations. We are proud that demographically, we represent America's future. Look, we don't compromise the good life. San Antonio has every single thing you'd expect from a big city, but our people can afford to build a legacy here. San Antonio has been around 300 years. We plan to be here 3,000 more. Come and be a part of it. We'll build the city together. Next, I'm interviewing Leslie Allen Glick. Uh, he's co-chair in his law firm's International Trade and Customs Specialty Group. He's a national expert. He's an author about the USMCA and an attorney who represents import and export companies throughout the South Texas and North America. Mr. Uh, uh, Glick, uh, good, uh, good day, and we welcome you and um, say thank you for joining us. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, your role as a co-chair in international trade and customs and in creating uh, and helping implement uh, the uh, USMCA. Okay, well, thank you, Charles. Well, I'm co-chair of my firm's uh, uh, practice group. I don't want to take credit for being one of the uh, uh, negotiators of NAFTA. I was part of what they consider the private sector uh, group that very often is briefed. Uh, they can continue to be um, uh, asset holders of people, stakeholders that have an interest. So I was involved in most of the briefings for USMCA, both from the government and the Congress. And going back to NAFTA, I have to admit that I'm uh, old enough to remember NAFTA and actually was involved in that too. Uh, as you know, I wrote a book on NAFTA. Now I'm updating it into a book on USMCA. Uh, coming out with uh, Kluwer Law International in, in November. So I've seen a lot about this, but I have to say first to start off that I have a good affinity with South Texas. Uh, from my very first job, uh, even before NAFTA, we had what you now consider still around the Maquiladoras. And I was traveling down to Laredo and Eagle Pass and many of those cities on the border. Usually I would fly into San Antonio and rent a car so I know the area where most of you are, and it's one of my uh, favorite parts of the country. Spent a lot of time there. Uh, you know, when we're talking about NAFTA and how it's changed uh, the South Texas, I remember my first trip to Laredo. You probably remember this. They still had dirt roads. And now you go out there in the Mines Road and big industrial parks and warehouses. So you can't deny that NAFTA has had a good effect on uh, that part of the country, bringing in lots of commerce and trucks and railroad. So I'm a big advocate of NAFTA. I think it was very successful. You hear a lot of critics say NAFTA do this, NAFTA do that. But when you look at the statistics, it's been beneficial to all three countries. So now in my role as an attorney, I help people with a lot of the legal aspects. For example, one of the, both the NAFTA and USMCA in order to qualify for the benefits, you have to meet the rules of origin. And there are certain rules you have to follow as to regional value and local content. And uh, a lot of times these aren't so simple. And uh, Customs does validations where they go and check on people's records. So um, it's been a lot of work, but uh, I'm glad to see that USMCA was signed on July 1st, or not signed, but implemented on July 1st. And uh, after many years of negotiation and some rough spots, uh, everybody seems to be moving along. And uh, I think the benefits will be substantial. Well, thank you uh, uh, for, for that uh, insight. Um, you know, uh, over the last uh, a couple of uh, months, uh, from the real estate side, in North America, uh, the, uh, the major organizations, the Canadian realtors, the Mexican uh, uh, realtors, and then, uh, of course, the National Association of Realtors in the United States um, have issued uh, joint press statements and so on applauding this first uh, stage of the uh, USMCA. And uh, part of that uh, um, is because uh, all, all the, from the realtor or association side, uh, uh, the, the general insight uh, that they have is that this will be good for the economy, 
It'll be good for communities. It'll be good for sustainable economic development. And that's good for real estate uh, because that results in um, um, the building um, of and continued building of, of the Texas uh, lifestyle economy and our children's future. So thank you for your role in, in helping to make some of that happen. What um, advice, given uh, that perspective, uh, can you uh, give to uh, the people in the audience here, uh, particularly in the commercial real estate, about how you, uh, from your vantage point, can help or see deals that need to be done actually come together, which is a one trick, yet funded, convincing somebody with money, and enduring any of the feasibility stages and result in a close and ultimately some commission. Um, any thought about, you know, uh, how under these new rules or your understanding of them or where it's going, that it, uh, in terms of uh, uh, transactions, uh, does the USMCA help us or not? Okay, well, that's a good question. There's one part of the USMCA that everybody agrees was a great improvement. Um, many people call it, you know, USMCA, the uh, modernized NAFTA because when NAFTA took effect, there was no internet. So there's a special chapter now on digital trade. And particularly now in this uh, COVID era, this digital trade recognizes and legitimizes the cross-border uh, use of the internet, electronic signatures, electronic auth auth authentications, uh, many of the things that's necessary to do business now. And this is all now incorporated into the USMCA. They've also made it clear that neither country or none of the three countries can impose a digital tax. This is very popular in Europe now. They're trying to tax the internet providers. So it keeps the internet free, encourages uh, e-commerce, and uh, facilitates the signing of contracts and the making of deals. So I think that's one of the best provisions. Um, you know, not too many provisions directly deal with real estate but there's a lot of things that indirectly deal with real estate, like the energy provisions. Uh, there's now some provisions that facilitate the movement of uh, hydrocarbons and pipelines and streamline the approval of uh, LNG exports that are gonna create jobs and are gonna create new uh, investment. So I think all of that is, is very positive. Uh, the auto industry was a big focus uh, because it's very integrated. All of the big producers in the U.S. have plants in Mexico, and they put in some tough new rules of origin for automotive, raising it from 62% uh, up as high as 75, and uh, some labor content that it, an average of the wages in Mexican on a plant level have to be at least $16 an hour. This is tough for the Mexicans, but may in the long run result in more onshoring of these automotive jobs back into the border because they may not be able to meet this $16 with their Mexican plants. So uh, all in all, I think it all, you know, when you talk to the White House, the U.S. Trade Representative, their goal was to get more jobs back in the U.S. and I think that will happen. How would that uh, same uh, line of reasoning take us if we uh, say, for example, uh, pharmaceuticals. Where in a, all of that negotiation did pharmaceutical manufacturing and the ability to move, uh, you know, big pharma, mid pharma um, around the world and potentially um, give incentives to land it in the USA and preferably Texas? Well, there's an intellectual property chapter that um, enforces and uh, brings to Mexico some of the rules that existed in the US. It extends the term of copyrights and uh, certain issues dealing with uh, pharmaceuticals that I think 
to be honest, the pharmaceutical industry had a big role in uh, getting those in, and I think it will gen generally uh, benefit the, uh, the trade in pharmaceuticals. Well, that's good news. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in South Texas, there's a minor industry of crossing the border to buy your uh, uh, drugs. Um, so in the uh, negotiations, the de minimis uh, pricing uh, before you have to pay taxes or what you can take in dollar value or pesos across borders and so on. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, uh, that's one of the kind of more controversial areas. The United States allows up to $800 to come in from Mexico and Canada uh, without paying duty and without formal customs formalities. Mexico, and I don't, I'm not sure I have the exact figure, but I think it's more something like $210. So there was a lot of pressure during the negotiations that Mexico should bring their level up to where the US is. I believe Mexico did increase their level, but it's still short of where the US is. Obviously the FedEx is and the UPS would like to see all of these countries have a high level so they wouldn't have to have delays going through customs and pay duties on small packages. So that's sort of some unfinished business where I understand the US is gonna continue and it's the same with Canada. They'd like to see both Canada and Mexico bring their level up to $800 exemption. Getting in the uh, trucks and heading up IH35, um, are the regional value uh, content rules and the labor value content rules um, substantially changed that will make a difference as to if you've got uh, facilities uh, already in place, why you might consider relocating them or expanding them? Well, these rules are a lot tougher than they were under NAFTA. The amount of regional value content, and there's also a rule that 70% of the steel and aluminum that goes into any automotive, automobile built in the US has to come from North America. So that's gonna shift some of the jobs around. Of course, it's all for North America. I think the emphasis was let's try to uh, keep third countries, particularly in Asia, from taking advantage of the USMCA by uh, shipping things into Mexico that then go into a uh, auto assembly to make it harder for them. So to the extent that all of this will have to have more content, it'll be good for US, Mexico, and Canada. I think the labor value content part is definitely gonna favor the US because um, as you know, the minimum wage in Mexico is, is much lower than $16 an hour. And the rules allow them to account a certain amount, I believe up to 10% of engineering jobs. But many US companies will probably need perhaps to bring back some jobs into the US. Well, will that uh, be true as well for textiles and their supply chains? Like Yeah, the textiles next to auto parts have the second most uh, complex rules of origin. Some of them are became stricter. Uh, for example, under the USMCA, and this wasn't true under NAFTA, you have to source sewing thread, elastic fabrics, pocketing, coated fabrics, all have to come from North America, where they didn't under NAFTA. At the same time, there is a, an exemption for kinds of materials such as rayon, uh, visible lining fabric uh, that don't, uh, aren't produced domestically, and they have a de minimis rule, which used to be 7%, now 10%. So up to 10% of a textile can now come from outside of the North American region. So in some ways it's tightened, some ways liberalized. You know, a lot of people in the textile industry on all three countries spent a lot of time working this out, uh, but there's still pretty strict rules. What about local uh, data storage? Uh, as opposed to having to, um, and, and, and the whole concept of data storage is, is in and of itself, that's an exploding industry. Yeah, uh, okay, well that's a good point. It's covered under the new digital service agreement. There's a provision that no country 
make as a condition of doing business there that you have to localize your servers and your data storage there. Uh, some countries, developing countries and other parts of the world have laws like this, that you can't have an internet service provider unless you have all your hardware in that country and then they can tax it and control it. So this was very good that it's a provision now and it ensures more, uh, more openness, more freedom uh, for people to do business there. The, uh, the discussions about 5G kind of networks and integrating all of, for example, South Texas and Central Texas and new, um, um, let's call it broadly, internet-related grids, uh, is that impacted at all? Well, I, there's nothing specific on that. I think it would probably develop too close to the end of the negotiations, you know, that took two to three years to go on. But, you know, this is sort of a living document. There's working groups, particularly technical groups and groups on phytosanitary rules that are still meeting. Uh, some people would like to see a complete um, sort of reciprocity between uh, FDA and the Mexican uh, authorities there. So once a drug or a food is approved by one, but we're still working on that. That's a, you know some issues that will be ongoing. And uh, two recent investment decisions, one Navistar in San Antonio and Tesla outside of Austin, that sort of cyber automated uh, vehicles along with automated trains and automated pipelines and automated ports on the one hand, you would think um, well, you lost some jobs, but on the other hand, it's creating jobs all over the place. Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on that, whether it's creating jobs or just moving jobs. Uh, although my office is in Washington, my firm is headquartered in Detroit, and the people up there are seeing a lot of these automotive jobs coming south. Texas, Georgia, Alabama, you know, now have become major uh, automotive producing um, states. Uh, part of it is non-union. Uh, you know, the laws are different there as far as mandatory union. People like the weather. Uh, Texas has no state sales tax. So those are the kind of things that are bringing people to the, to the South and Texas will be one of the beneficiaries of that. Maybe more so than the other states because you're right on the border. Are you uh, looking down the road in the next 10 years and with an optimistic set of lenses or uh, for the Detroits as well as the Dallases, as well as the Dentons, and as well as uh, South Texas? Well, yeah, I'm optimistic. Uh, I, I might mention, too, that uh, another real estate issue is the use of foreign trade zones, and I think that there's a increased interest in that. I know I'm involved in something with uh, involving in McAllen, and uh, a lot of people are interested in using the foreign trade zones, street trade zones, in connection with uh, uh, cross-border trade. So I'm happy to help people keep up. Uh, my, my email is glick at butzel.com. If you have a question or you want to be involved in something or you don't know how something is going to affect you, particularly new legislation, uh, I'd be happy to keep you informed. Uh, realtors are usually a very well organized and uh, uh, effective uh, lobbying group in Washington, but you know there's always different special issues that may be different in Texas, so uh, and maybe more uh, more tied in with the uh, USMCA. Well, yeah, thank you for giving uh, me personally and uh, all of our members and our uh, constituents and clients uh, here in South Texas, a lot to think about. We're looking forward to that positive ride over the next 10, 20 years. I think things are gonna be great in Texas. We're living demographic destiny. So um, uh, all we gotta do is know the rules and everyone plays by the rules. And uh, as long as folks like you guide us, I think we'll create more and more uh, closed uh, commercial deals. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. I very much appreciate it and look forward to our next conversation. I'm happy to now welcome uh, Gerald Schwebel. He's IBC Bank's EVP, a leading expert on international trade and finance. Interviewing Gerald will be ST Car board member Hector Romo, Jr. Jerry, uh, thanks again. Uh, let me, uh, 
uh, ask you a couple of questions. We'll start off with this. Uh, could you update us uh, on the Texas Business Advisory Council's recommendations of the Business Task Force that was set up by the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor? Right. Uh, I, I assume that was done in, in March, but uh, does that any of that still moving today and uh, it, it could affect the real estate industry? Well, uh, absolutely. It, it, uh, everything we're doing today is going to affect the real estate industry, it seems to be. But uh, first of all, let me thank you all for, for inviting me to be with you. Uh, yes, let me give you a bit of background. There are two groups that I want to clarify. One is a strike force group that was created by uh, Governor Abbott uh, that was uh, headed by uh, 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 Mr. Hoffines uh, uh, and a, a group of individuals appointed by the governor. The second group is uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick's uh, a task force. And the Governor Patrick's uh, task force is called Texas Back to Work Task Force. Uh, I was involved in Governor Patrick's task force and our CEO of our company, Dennis Nixon, was involved directly as part of the Governor Abbott's strike force. Uh, in particular for us, uh, our document that was released in April of this year, what was a, it was the document that included uh, uh, 17 different committees. Uh, there, was in the, there were 13 industry sectors that included construction and real estate. I was directly involved, you know, my area uh, as an advisor uh, was uh, to the supply chain uh, and global trade uh, committee, uh, but we were all privy to participate in the ongoing discussion and dialogue but all sectors. So my comments today uh, uh, may be more related to the more of the cross-border trade and the opportunities sure. for real estate uh, uh, investments, uh, primarily on, on the Texas side, because that's what I do every pretty much every day in my life. So, uh, but uh, we did come up with a red series of recommendations. Coincidentally, as we speak today, you know, we're still working on it, and we'll be doing an update because. From April to today, there have been some changes, and all we're doing is an update, we'll, which we will be submitting to Governor Patrick uh, this weekend, and then Governor Patrick will take that information. And I think as we're getting ready for the for the the next legislative session, I'm sure some of the information will be critical uh, for the Texas legislature to consider. Well, what do you think is a key takeaway uh, from that 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 you can? Well, most, most, of, most of the dialogue and most of the discussion, of course, because we were working on it back in March and April of this, of this year, focused on, of course, the, the, the pandemic scenario that we had. Of course, back then we were looking at, well, this is maybe short-lived, maybe. Uh, uh, I think no one would say this thing has gone on for so long. Okay. Uh, but there, there, are, there were some, some recommendations that are very critical and relevant to your sector. But it was more in line of how do we, the business sector, continue to stay open as essential industries, yeah. or how we, we can uh, open up should there be a, a potential sector that was uh, uh, considered not essential to be, to be closed. And you have seen over the course of the months, sectors open up, sectors shut down, and uh, so different areas have been affected in different ways. So what we see right now uh, more of a trend by the governor to the governors to open up Texas, but within the health protocol. So the, 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 the dialogue and the discussion is how do we cope with the pandemic and how do we, you know, how does it impact all of those measures on our businesses, uh, ongoing businesses, or even for that matter, even, even investments. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Jerry. Uh, uh, now, IBC, uh, has been very active uh, in catering to international border trade o over the right. years. Um, right. What are you hearing from your Mexican customers on growth due to the USMCA? If, we, if we're looking forward, you know? Well, uh, great question. You know, I've been working on, on trade issues for decades. Uh, and uh, back when you and I had more hair in our, in our heads, uh, it's, it, and uh, you and I go back a lot of years, uh, and you remember, you may remember Hector, and, and maybe for, for everyone that's, 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 that's 
you know, participating in, in this in this call and in this meeting, that we would spend a lot of time spending with companies that may be looking at Mexico as an investment option, manufacturing sectors. And there was a great opportunity back then when we were working in the early years of, of what was then the North American Free Trade Agreement, the opportunities that may present for Texas in particular, or the United States for all America, to look at Mexico as a partner uh, and, uh, and so that we could actually work, work together for the benefit of the consumer and become more competitive with the rest of the world. Uh, the basic concept. Uh, and uh, those years we were spending time advising U.S. companies or foreign companies that wanted to look at Mexico as an option because our company, our bank, which was founded in Laredo, Texas, where I-35 begins and ends, uh, we were a natural bank, uh, U.S. bank, Texas-based bank, to, that had the experience. And so my, my time back then in the, in the 80s and the 90s uh, it was 70s, late 70s, 80s, and 90s, was to help companies that were looking at Mexico. Now, ironically, I'm spending more time with some of those investors and companies and families that are looking at investing in the United States. So uh, in Mexico, as you very well know, there's been a change of administration, and the business community uh, is having its challenges, uh, and just like we are. So the, I see a lot of Mexican investors that have sought a great opportunity in doing business and investing in the United States. And a lot of it has been not only in businesses, but predominantly in, in real estate investments. So, so uh, you see them uh, being interested in increasing their real estate uh, decisions in Texas in general and, and maybe South Texas? Absolutely, because right now, as you know, the, the environment on, 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 on just short-term investments, uh, the, the rate environment has been low, to the lowest, lowest you know, we've seen in our modern lifetime. So they, they see real estate as, as a great opportunity to get a better return on their investment. That's why you're, you, you may, you're seeing more and more of those, those investors that have the liquidity to seek uh, you know, real estate investment opportunities here in Texas. And because Texas uh, has so much at stake of dealing with Mexico, Mexico is our number one trade partner. You tie in the jobs or the companies that invest in Texas and do business cross-border business, well, then it's, a, it's, it's ideal for the families that own those businesses to want to also invest in Texas. Now, you know, we're aware that uh, the, the lenders such as yourselves and other uh, lenders in equity and banking have had to adapt to a volatile uh, capital market, not only in the United States, but uh, internationally. Mm -hmm. um, what, what sectors do you feel are best poised, you think, uh, to take advantage of the developing opportunities giving this, this volatility? Uh, let's say well, let's that's always, that's, I get that question asked a lot. Hey, what should I invest in? What are, what are the areas? What should I focus my attention on it? And uh, the, way, the way I answer that question is that uh, you start out with what, what do you know what you do? Look at, your, look, look at what, you, what, what is your background? You know? Of course, right now, you've had, and, and many of them have had, have had to do a major paradigm change. Most of, most, of, most of Mexico has been more on the manufacturing side. They're assembled. But they manufacture, and and the, the, you know, being in Laredo, Texas, we're so close to cities like Monterrey and Santillo, where which are the manufacturing hubs. But the border, as a result of of, of, of the, the the Mexican manufacturing industry, used to be known as the maquiladora industry. Also, uh, since the, since the 60s, when they were really set up along the border, that became the focus of manufacturing. So. What those companies have had to do as a result of pandemic because of the uh, changes, they may have adapted and gone into a different realm of business. And we find a lot of the business for the PPE, uh, the personal protection equipment that have changed basically from doing, you know, widgets or shoes, hey, I can do masks. So there's a lot of that going on right now as since they have their operations and they were not doing what predominantly was their, their core business before, they've done a paradigm change to look at where the demand is. That's, that's great for them. They've been flexible and adapting to that. 
And we're doing that in the United States. The best example is Kodak in the United States, right? So Mexico is no different. Mexico is doing that. And I think that sector in the medical, the medical sector is, is, is and, and equipment and, and is, 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 is a major sector. I focus a lot more attention. The other sector that I, that I really, that I think all of us have become more aware of, of the importance of the supply chain and logistics sectors. That is, that is where I see, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, everything's got to move from one location to the other. There's nothing's produced, not everything's produced locally. So if you want to get food, if you want to get a tie, you want to get a shirt, you want to get gasoline, it either is, you know, got on a truck, was on a plane, on a train, and it got there from one place to the other. So the supply chain process, logistics, and that lends itself for, you know, creating hubs for distribution. I think that on the industrial side, I think is an area that has a lot of potential as well. Sure, uh, and uh, I know there's been a lot of e-commerce uh, development in the area. There's automotive, uh, there's the automotive suppliers, a few we know that are coming possibly from Mexico to supply uh, their U.S. counterparts. And uh, I know Laredo, uh, in the last few years, has had tremendous growth on the Laredo side in real estate. Uh, it's amazing all the land that uh, has been developed with, with facilities going up and major players right. there. And, um, and we're seeing that... Uh, you know, through the Laredo, uh, I mean, San Antonio area, but uh, we, we, uh, we're hoping, you know, we'll have that uh, dynamic uh, throughout the area. Right. Well, you're absolutely correct. You know, Laredo is, is the leading port, land port in the country. It's been competing with LA Long Beach back and forth. Who's number one, who's number two. Uh, 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 LA Long Beach has been more impact, impacted by the Far East, the Chinese trade. We're not, ours is protected basically more North American or even, you know, uh, even though uh, we do do business as a company, you know, we've done business in 40 different countries. Uh, it's international bank of commerce, you know, people say, well, I am the I in IBC bank because that's, that's what our core business has been. Uh, because this also, you know, in years past, we did business all over the world. More in the last 30 years, focus has been more North American as a region. So yes, I agree with you that, that in our in Laredo, as, they, as I said earlier, by virtue that we live where the, the start mile one of Interstate 35 is. And uh, so that's where the supply chain flows. And um, so you have the international trade infrastructure in place, custom brokers, logistics warehouses, uh, all, all trade services, this is the hub, and and that growth that you have seen uh, with warehousing and distribution centers, and, and and ports of entry operations as a result of that growth in trade, and that's why USMCA uh, has been so important to us, and why we've been engaged in the process of making sure that that trade does not get disrupted. And you alluded to a very important point: there are there are areas in the USMCA, they were not included under NAFTA, and you alluded to it earlier, e-commerce, digital trade, energy sector, we, telecommunications, all of those sectors that were included in here, there's even a chapter on competitiveness. There's a chapter on, on uh, trade facilitation. All of that, if you really look at it, it's to facilitate the flow of legitimate commerce and trade and people. And that's why IBC and our company has been so engaged and has gained the experience that, that we have right now. Now, honing in a little bit, Jerry, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, CRE uh, providers, corporate real estate, uh, adding value to commercial and, uh, and trade industries? Uh, well, you know, there, there are options. To, you know. to, to support those industries. Well, definitely, definitely, that, that, that needs to continue. And, you know, you've got to have it there. you got, uh, you know, people will take risk for a reason. they got a better return of their money. But you've got to be engaged. you got to do your homework. you got to be involved. Uh, if, if I had a dollar for everybody to tell me that they, 
that they, they know Mexico, and they understand Mexico, for example, or they know Texas. But their idea of being in Texas, they've been to Dallas, but the idea of being, by the way, that's that trade that's flowing, that, that, that horn you may be hearing coming out of my office, we have the Kansas City rail line that, yes. that runs, that train runs by my office, you know, <laughs> 10 times a day. Uh, and that is commerce, that is grain, commodities going into Mexico that may turn into, you know, tortillas or may turn into bread, uh, et cetera. So, uh, or it may be, you know, uh, uh, a petroleum based product that's going in for plastic injection plants. So I always want to, you know. Yes, I remember that. I remember. Uh, I've been there, seen that. But, but going back to your original question is that, is that uh, it's important that, 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 uh, that people understand, the investor understands uh, what is going on in the region that they're seeking and that, that they have, they, they weigh in on all the options of what's available, or it's a bank, or uh, maybe it's an investor for a real estate investment trust, you know, you know other forms of, 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 of funds that may be looking, and that they understand clearly that they add value to the region and then they get a better return on their investment, of course, right? So, so you're open. Uh, oh, yeah. You're open to... We, 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 we predominantly... Real estate. Lender. Yes, yes. We, know, our, our, we, are, we, we, we basically are a real estate commercial bank, you know. Our, my virtue, as I said, by being on the border, we have the experience up and down the border, up the I-35 corridor, Houston, you know, Oklahoma. So... Uh, you know, commercial real estate is, is, is our bread and butter from, from the lending side. So, because and, and because I, as I said, the the, the logistics and, and distribution supply chain that 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 extends to everybody. No one's you know, whether it's like I said, food or any product, it it, it just it's just natural that as we see the flow of trade, what are the products? What are the companies? What are the investments? that allude to that, whether it's Tesla moving, let's say, to Austin and the automotive sector, as you said, or it's or it's uh, perishables. You know, we just, uh, in Laredo, we'll be housing the, the largest avocado distributor in the country, you know, and uh, or right now, you know, and that's, I, we've diversified away in Laredo, trying to diversify away from the automotive sector, even though it's a predominantly major port of our, of the products that that, 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 that could cross through here to uh, fresh produce and perishables, kind of like as an option to the, to the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and, and we need to diversify even more into other sectors. I, I believe in biomed and, and the technology side uh, that accommodates that digital trade. Excellent point, Jerry. Well, thank you so much and uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you soon. Hope to. Take Good luck care. everyone. Our last presenter today is Keith Patridge, President, CEO of the McAllen Economic Development Corporation and McAllen's Foreign Trade Zone. Interviewing Keith will be ST Car Past President Randy Summers. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Randy. Pleasure to be with you this morning. Well, it's a pleasure to <coughs> excuse me to have you with us this morning as well, and and we know how important. South Texas is to uh, actually the rest of the United States, uh, as well as Canada with uh, everything that travels through South Texas from Mexico uh, on its way up north. And so as we talk a little bit this morning, I'd like to see what do you feel the top industries in Texas are that will benefit from US MCA? Without question, Randy, um, all types of manufacturing are gonna benefit. Uh, with a focus on automotive, uh, steel and aluminum, uh, but plus uh, medical devices, uh, PPE, uh, pharma, and electronic components that not necessarily because of the USMCA, but really because of COVID-19 and the problems that it has brought to light with the uh, sourcing of critical materials from foreign countries. Uh, also, the market for agricultural products will continue to grow for Texas. One of the biggest changes involves uh, the automotive industries. And what are some of those changes and how will automotive manufacturing plants in Texas benefit? 
Well, uh, you know, NAFTA was 25 years old before it was replaced, and its rules were really outdated. Uh, a lot of things in technology had changed that didn't exist when NAFTA was created. Uh, things like cell phones, things like laptop computers, really wasn't thought about when that was uh, when NAFTA was created. And so it contained a lot of provisions that, quite frankly, allowed companies to free ride and in many cases actually discouraged automotive manufacturing and investment in the US. Some of the more important uh, areas of NAFTA that we see as very important to us is the USMCA increased the regional value content uh, from 62.5% for automobiles uh, to 75% over the next three years. Now, what that means is that instead of 62.5% of the product value must be coming from one of the three countries, that's now increased to 75%, which is pretty significant uh, increase. And from a manufacturing standpoint, makes it very difficult to manufacture somewhere else and still qualify projects or products uh, for the automotive sector. Uh, and this has actually resulted in a heightening of interest from uh, foreign automotive suppliers to establish operations in North America. The uh, cross, uh, crossing of, of goods into the United States uh, as well as uh, into uh, Mexico, US, uh, USMCA requires the establishing of a uniform system for cross-border movement of the goods. Is, is this going to expedite the cross-border movement of those goods and how different are those requirements than what was originally in place? Um, I think so. Uh, you know, one of the goals of USMCA was really to make the movement of goods uh, between the partner countries, US, Canada, and Mexico, I think simpler, uh, not as much paperwork, and they've tried to do that. I'm not sure they've accomplished it, but they've tried and more uniform. Um, you know, historically, and you're, you're, you've been in the Valley all your life, as, uh, for, and so you, you're aware of what I'm saying, but historically the process was often applied differently between different ports of entry, uh, particularly on the Mexico side, where you had the interpretation of regulations or laws or, or uh, the process of crossing was totally different between ports of entry, which made it very confusing for companies, uh, particularly the small importer and exporter to figure out how to ship product in, back and forth across the border. Uh, the USMCA has tried to improve that process. Uh, but however, having said that, in my opinion, really what is speeding up the cross-border shipments today is more of what CBP has been doing to streamline the process with the unified customs clearance uh, program that they're implementing across the border, uh, the CTPAT FAST and other trusted shipper programs, and now new technology that's being installed at the ports of entry to improve the inspection process so that you don't have the unloading of trucks. They're actually able to see everything that's in there without disrupting the shipments and it makes it much faster. So uh, I think that USMCA, while I think it's made it possible, I think the most of the improvement has actually come because of technology and applications of that technology by CBP. So all of this is going to really change and we kind of alluded to it earlier, the uh, uh, affect the industrial warehousing needs are going to uh, that are going to be required uh, in South Texas. Um, what do you see in that growth and uh, for warehousing needs as well as this also includes a lot of agriculture and and uh, cold storage needs that are going to be needed. Randy, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that if, if, you're, if your listeners or your, your membership takes anything away, we are desperate for industrial space, at least in the McAllen area, the MSA. Um, 
we have a huge demand for it. As a matter of fact, we're already seeing the results of USMCA, as I mentioned earlier, that is driving a lot of that. Uh, mentioned we are currently working with between, uh, well, it's actually 27 companies right now. If we were to get all of those companies, that's about 2.8 million square feet of space that we will need. That's not even included in the numbers I'm talking about now. Uh, but when you look at the second quarter of 2020 CBRE McAllen uh, MSA industrial report, which came out a few weeks ago, uh, Right now in the McAllen MSA, we have a 2.3 industrial building vacancy. 2.3%. That's almost unheard of. Exactly. Uh, we don't have anything. But when you look at that vacancy rate and then look at the user demand that was identified by CBRE of 1.6 million square feet, you can see where we're at. This is actually 460,000 square feet more. The demand is 460,000 square feet more than the total available space in the market. So we're already in a deficit of 460,000 square feet with the companies identified by CBRE. And we have another 27 companies that is looking at another 2.8 million square feet. So we need buildings desperately. And as far as, far as the second part of your question on cold storage, uh, of course, as you are aware, uh, the Hildago, Far, Ansel Duis port of entry is the number one port of entry uh, for fresh fruits and vegetables. And because of the new highway from the west coast of Mexico, and the continued growth of, ex, of uh, agriculture in Mexico, coupled with the increasing market demand in the U.S., uh, we're seeing a steady increase in the demand for U.S. cold storage. Uh, and in addition to the conversion of existing dry warehousing to cold storage, which we're seeing quite a bit of that, or cooler space, and the new construction we're working, we are working with companies that either want to do a build a suit or lease space uh, in the amount of over 500,000 square feet just in cold storage uh, requirements. So uh, it's, uh, we have a, we have an opportunity here for your membership to start looking at this area, for, uh, particularly in the industrial area. We need it desperately. And what's important with that is that almost all of our sites are located in opportunity zones. So what that means is, you know, of course, if, if they have clients that have problems or the issues with, uh, with uh, a capital gains tax, that's a great opportunity to help them out. Sounds like great opportunities for developers as far as, uh, realtors and uh, great job opportunities that are going to be coming up with uh, all that development. That's, that's very exciting. How can our industry continue to uh, assist um, the uh, EDCs uh, and South Texas in the, in the commercial real estate? The realtors are key support of our efforts to bring jobs and investment to our area. Uh, just as they are everywhere. Uh, but the biggest thing that, that the commercial real estate could do for us is to help us bring investment to the community to build new buildings. Uh, as you know, we have thousands, literally thousands of acres of class A industrial sites uh, available and most of them are located in, as I mentioned, opportunity zones. But one of the things that we really need to help, and I think this is statewide, is we really need the help of the realtors in helping to paint a more accurate picture of the opportunities that exist in South Texas. You know, you, you brought it up, you alluded it to it just a couple of minutes ago. For the last 14 years, we've been dealing with the constant challenges caused by the Mexico drug wars. Uh, but yet we've continuously been ranked as one of the safest areas in the United States with the FBI crime stats. 
And at the same time, South Texas has been identified in the national media as ground zero on many political hot button issues involving immigration, trade, the border wall, and most recently we're getting impacted nationally by Hurricane Hannah, the results of Hurricane Hannah, and now COVID-19, we're the hot spot. And uh, it has impacted, that over the last 14 years is impacting the visual that our area has to people that are not familiar with us and it's in a, and we're being we're seen as a negative light. We get a lot of companies that come in that say, "Well, is it safe there?" Well, tell me about this. And it all is relating to things that they've seen on the 24-hour news cycle. So, and we're not asking anybody to say things that aren't true. We just want to be and have an accurate picture uh, uh, presented of what Texas and South Texas has to offer companies and investments. Uh, and so that's one of the big things. I agree with you 100%, Keith. And I think that uh, the Valley is, uh, the Rio Grande Valley and South Texas is just a hotbed of opportunity. And um, I'm excited to be a part of it and uh, being able to work in the communities as well as work in the Valley. And, and I know that you are too. Keith, we want to thank you for your insights that uh, you've provided for us on the on South Texas and the USMCA, and just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And we look forward to helping you in in any way that we can uh, in the future. Thanks for being with us, Keith. Thank you very much, Randy, and uh, congratulations to all your membership. And I wish them the best. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've had uh, gained some great insights. Uh, we have an upcoming uh, seven-hour CE class on 1031 exchanges with uh, YU Lamb on October 26. To learn more about this class and STCAR, please visit stcar.org. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference, and have a great day.